Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Here we go. It, it, it's, it's nice and wholesome. You don't need to worry about bringing your kids. There's no cussing going on. There's no off-color humor. They're supposed to be wholesome. You know, we don't serve alcohol or anything like that. So I mean, every we kids from little lap sitters all the way up to 90 some years old enjoy the show. It just seems to fit. Okay, I'm the. Uh, one of the vocalists and instruments I specialize in are banjo and mandolin and play them in that order in the band. We have Scott Durkee who's played for years. In fact, he used to play all around uh, Montana and the Dakotas, that area. He's our guitarist. And we have Fran Gack with us who plays the bass and fiddle. And we have Jeff Menton with us who is uh, probably one of the best fiddle players in the country. He's played professionally for years. And we all are pretty much multi-instrumentalists, so if someone falls over on the stage or something, we can pick up for him and <laughs> not miss too many beats. <laughs> right now I'm uh, getting the fire pit ready for a demonstration that we typically do. I'll be getting the coals ready and that type of thing and putting together a couple of cobblers which we'll be making in the Dutch ovens. And right now we just have the fire going, I'm making some coals and I'll preheat the ovens a little bit and then we'll be putting the uh, cobblers together and get them cooking. Typically they'll get their ticket when they come down we always have our uh, dessert table and all of them are vintage desserts, the Victorian era, the spice cake, the chocolate cake and everything. And we'll always have the Arbuckles coffee going and cookies and that type of stuff so people can sit and visit and have coffee and cookies before supper. And weather allowing we'll have the wagon up so people can take rides before the show. We have the petting zoo over there for the kids, have music playing and at uh, 6 o'clock Supper is served, and that's the typical double line so people can get through it real quick. And we have the cowboy supper of baked potato, there's baked, uh, fiery baked beans, and they have a choice of either a barbecue chicken breast or cowboy style roast beef. And there's a nice big biscuit and a peach slice with that. And then, of course, the big dessert table and Arbuckle's coffee and, and lemonade. And we eat from six till seven or thereabouts, depending on the size of the crowd, and then the uh, music show kicks in. So it's all you can eat and good music to boot, so it's a lot of fun. You think about if the old chuck wagon cooks really had a job because they had to get up before everyone first thing in the morning and uh, feed everyone a nice great big breakfast, kind of put together a little lunch they could take with them when they were starting to drive the herd and then they had to race ahead to get to where the camp was going to be the next night and the whole time they were going they had to be picking up sticks or anything under the sun. They could burn, go in, get camp set and then have uh, supper ready for the cowboys when they came in and boy those guys could those guys could eat. This is fairly typical of what you'd have for a truck box. Usually this would have been on the back of a wagon. I have them under cover in case it rains. But uh, most of them were designed this way. A lot of them had kind of a slap to the top here. Some of them had drawers that just kind of depended on how the person wanted to design it. First one, uh, these was built by a man named Charlie Goodnight. And he, they figure he's kind of the father of the truck wagon. He took an old military Studebaker wagon and uh, 
If you like those, because they have the iron axles and stuff, they'd hold up real well to these long trips. Because prior to these, a cowboy just had, had, to, had to survive on what they could take with them. And typically that was hard tack, uh, believe it or not, canned tomatoes, because they could open one of those and drink the juice and it would really help quench their thirst and eat the tomatoes, but it made for some pretty hard times on the trail. So when they could take one of these and put it in the back of a wagon and have it loaded up, they could really cook uh, some better meals for the uh, meals for the cowboys. But they're pretty uh, ingenious, really. Had all your foodstuffs in there, and then just it's on the back of the wagon, you just lift that flap. There could be any type of enclosure on there whatsoever, and when you stop to make camp, you just uh, drop that flap. There's your your workspace. Typically, a wagon would go out, and uh, coffee was so important that the Arbuckles coffee typically would come in 100 pound cases, and there's one account where there was 400 pounds of coffee that went out on one wagon during the drives. So they'd have that potatoes, flour, of course, to make biscuits and that type of thing. So the wagon would be totally filled with foodstuffs, plus there were bed rolls and everything else in there. So I mean, it was you know like, almost like shipping freight and everything, and it must have been a real science to make sure everything was organized. But this is kind of typical of the type of things you would see in the wagons in the way of the old tinware they would have had because they just would have grabbed anything extra they had in the in the uh, in the ranch house. Beans, cornmeal, and that kind of stuff would have come in the big bags and uh, crockery. There would have been a clock in here because poor Cookie had to wake up about four in the morning to keep the fire going or whatever. Lanterns, uh, anything they figure would help to uh, cook and serve the cowboys. And typically, if this were on the back of a wagon, there would have been another box underneath called the boot, and that's where all of the cast iron Dutch ovens would have gone, the fry pans, and that type of stuff. There would have been a meat saw, cleavers, and that type of thing. This is lightly loaded. The ones they would have had in the back of a wagon just would have been absolutely jam-packed full because this was both the kitchen and a lot of times the cook had to serve as doctor, so there would be liniments and, and you know, sewing kits and everything under the sun that the cowboys might need to be able to survive on the trail for up to five months. So that's a chuck box. <laughs> Some people may think this is out of place for Minnesota, but actually, uh, later on, I mean, the cattle drives, the big ones, lasted from about two years after the Civil War, 1867, up till about 19, or 1881. That was the extent of all of the big cattle drives. The biggest year was 1871, where they pushed 600,000 cattle through from Texas up to the trailheads. But they saturated the market then, and then things started to go down. And by that time, ranches started taking hold in the North Country here. But during the uh, Dust Bowl years and the big drought at the beginning of the 1900s and stuff, there was lots of ranchers from the Dakotas and Montana that had no choice but to ship their cattle to Minnesota here, and especially around this area to the lakes and everything, because we had the water and everything. And so actually, this area does have a history in the cattle business. It's important to keep the old music like the old cowboy songs and we do a lot of songs from the 1800s and even some Civil War music and when you have a venue like this and you can perform those it helps keep that music alive and because of that you're helping keep history alive. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org. If you have segment ideas pertaining to North Central Minnesota, contact us at legacy at lptv.org.
Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund by the vote of the people on November 4, 2008.